I grew up in a small town called Buma, South Sudan. We did not have no food, we did not have no clean water. My parents had to go hunt for food. There was a lot of other tribes that would actually would come and steal my father's cattle. It was just a rough life. At age three, I was diagnosed with polio. I woke up in the morning and I, I was crawling, I couldn't walk. So my parents were like, what is going on? They had to like dig a hole and put my leg in there, put me like half my body in there and just actually bury my leg so it can be straight. And it, it was so painful, it was painful. But they tried everything they can to make me walk. And then from there, we had to move to Ethiopia, a town called Dima Refugee Camp. I didn't have a wheelchair, I had to crawl everywhere to, to get to places. My parents applied for a visa and we got denied the first time. Then the second time, we, we got approved. They put me in sixth grade and I was 12 years old. I did not know no English. I did not, I did not know how to read it all right. It was tough. It was tough for me. I, I had to go through a lot of things. I had to go through a lot. I saw some wheelchair basketball game on TV. I was like, wow, I can, I can actually do something like that. And I just, I was just flying. It was just, I feel like I just, it was just a different chair. And I have never, never had seen a chair that fast before. So when I got in, it was just, I was just pushing. I couldn't stop pushing. Play with a team called Houston Hot Wheels. And that's where everything started. I saw a video on Facebook. A guy going to my country to go do a wheelchair basketball. I was like, wow, if I can connect with this guy. He contacted me very soon after and said, you know, it's always been his dream to go back to his home country, which he hasn't seen since he left when he was three, and teach his countrymen how to play wheelchair basketball. Sooner or later, we met and, and here we are. <laughs> we just <laughs> made it happen. <laughs> So now is finally the time. I'm really excited to have Malat coming with me. Malat discovered wheelchair basketball when he was living in Houston and has become, you know, one of the top players in the United States. He'll be able to show these players a lot of things that I've explain to them, but couldn't necessarily demonstrate. Long flight, you're back home. <laughs> but more so, I think just having someone who came from where they came from, who speaks their language, who understands their culture, not only from a basketball perspective, but from a life perspective, will allow us to be a lot closer. Just to be with my own tribe, speak the language, eat the food, you know? <laughs> I mean, you just enjoy the culture, it's just, that's home to me, that's home. When I was 19, I was getting ready to go back for my second year as a high jumper on the University of Oregon track team. Shortly before going back, I was in a serious car accident and broke my back, severed my spinal cord and became a paraplegic. From that time, um, I sort of thought that my, my athletic ambitions and dreams were probably over. But three years later, I was asked to try a wheelchair basketball by a local team where I was living at the time. For me, was, uh, I mean, it was a revelation and fell in love with it right away. It was something that I didn't realize was missing from my life for the first three years after my injury. I went back to school relatively quickly and graduated in four years and thought, you know, everything is, is great. My, my life is good. But it wasn't until I actually played wheelchair basketball for the first time that I realized that there had been this kind of void that, that part of me that I had, you know, had been such a, a central part of who I was before I got hurt had been missing. 
in 2009, I was asked by a brand new team that had just been formed in a little village in the north of Afghanistan for someone to come and teach them how to play. And for whatever reason, at that exact point in my life, that seemed like an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. And while I was there, I was introduced to some people from the International Committee of the Red Cross. I've helped to start these types of sport programs, particularly wheelchair basketball in Afghanistan, Cambodia, India, Palestine, Ethiopia, and now South Sudan. The way we structure these programs, we start by just creating kind of a grassroots opportunity-based movement where the entire goal is just mobilizing as many people with physical disabilities as possible to start playing sport. Malat and I are going to teach you specific techniques for controlling your chair. You're going to have your thumbs on the tires and your hands wrapped around the rim. You see Malat, 61 of us is uh, gone high like, like him. He's very fresher. What I see here is that there's all this athletic potential. There are guys that are natural athletes that are excited about the sport, but the big challenge that they have is finding the places and time for them to practice on a regular basis. I see those athletes out there. They were talking about they used to crawl, they, you know, back when I was in the refugee camp, I did not have no shoes, nothing, no clothes. And I feel like those athletes, they're going through the same thing. I can relate to them. The poverty in South Sudan is of a scale that I had never experienced before. It was shocking to me. There's no government-run electricity. They have their own generators, and gas is incredibly expensive. So most of the time, they're dealing without electricity. There's no government-provided water. So people have to wait until water trucks come by and then they have to pay money to get water. Most of the kids here are not going to school. There's no education here. Probably about 60% of our patients um, have disabilities due to conflict-related injuries. And what is very specific for South Sudan is the high number of gunshot injuries. One of the goals of this program is kind of to overcome a lot of the political and social divisions that are so pervasive in this country. If we're going to show that, then really the players should all be working with one another, not just competing against each other on a, a tribal or a regional basis. The sport is always going to unite people, no matter what. They were training hard and just wanted to move forward as one team, as one nation. Sport being a very powerful tool, not only to make them into sports persons, but also to give them physical and psychological strength and believing in themselves. The primary goal of starting to do this work in the first place was more than just teaching some guys how to play a sport. Now, what I really want to see happen is that they stop seeing themselves first as disabled and see themselves more as athletes or as, you know, professionals or as husbands or sisters or whatever other personal definition they have. But also through that to change the perspectives of societies. I want our community to look at them in a good way, not feel petty for them. 
what the able people do, we can also do. Sport gives me a lot of confidence in myself. It just brings out different energy to go out there and accomplish things. So what I hope to say is just, you know, <laughs> everybody just, all the athletes, to have wheelchairs and get involved in sports, be active, and have more confidence by themselves. Thank you.